here to be on a panel and give some feedback, I think, for this morning. <coughs> this is the purpose, but we wanted to do that. This is, uh, some of you are familiar with that. The name, can you say the name? The language of letting go. The language of letting go. <coughs> some of you have used the melody baby work already in recovery. But I use it as a reminder not to have control my environment. And so it's really helpful because when you have over control, you're really hurting people. So I asked her to read the reading for today, which is December 7th, and then we'll go from there. <coughs> so let's relax and listen to this. When the time is right, there are times when we simply don't know what to do or where to go next. Sometimes these periods are brief, sometimes lingering. We can get through these times. We can rely on our program and the disciplines of recovery. We can cope by using our faith, other people, and our resources. Except uncertainty, we do not always have to know what to do or where to go next. We do not always have to clear, have clear direction. Refusing to accept the inaction and limbo makes things worse. It's okay to temporarily be without direction. Say, I don't know, and be comfortable with that. We do not have to try to force wisdom, knowledge, or clarity when there is none. While waiting for direction, we do not have to put our life on hold. Let go of anxiety and enjoy life. Relax. Do something fun. Enjoy the love and the beauty in your life. Accomplish simple tasks. They may have nothing to do with solving the problem or finding the direction, but that is what we can do in the interim. Clarity will come. The next step will present itself. Indecision, inactivity, and the lack of direction will not last forever. Today I will accept my circumstances even if I lack direction and insight. I will remember to do things that make myself and others feel good during this time. I will trust that clarity will come of its own accord. Especially if she was going to be late and I was going to pick her up at the mall. 
mom, I'm going to get a ride from somebody else, please don't come. And that would be because I would go and if they weren't where they were supposed to be at a certain time, I would totally blow up. It didn't matter who was around. It didn't matter if the clerks, if the police, the security, I didn't care who was around. I just knew that I was beyond that point. And uh, so, so my daughter is now in her 30s. Uh, we've done some healing. We have more healing to do. But I think what I wanted to emphasize is how how this gets passed intergenerationally if we don't uh, if we don't heal heal from it. Um, and my daughter's relationship with her grandmother. Um, my daughter saw the pattern between me and my mother, and my daughter shut down. She didn't have a relationship with her grandmother that was very platonic, and and so uh, I know that hurt my mom a lot, uh, and and I I think my daughter is still holding that. We haven't talked about it. It's something that we do need need to talk about. I work as a therapist and. Uh, and I see these walls a lot with people that have experienced trauma. And a lot of times the work, someone mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different methods and, and different ways of working with, with trauma. And there are, there are a lot of new things that they call evidence-based practice. And, 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 it, and some of them work with some people and some of them work, don't work with some people. And, and it's really about the relationship. Um, but the main thing I wanted to say was that trust, building trust and building relationships is key and really important. It's important to our healing. And how I explain it to my clients is that you have a lot of armor. It says, oh, you're wearing a lot of armor. And in order for, for a little bit of light to shine in and for a little bit of your light to shine out, we're going to try to just crack that armor just a little bit, a little bit at a time. And so, uh, with people that are, are willing to take the risk, because it, uh, you know, there's no magic, uh, no magic button. People have to be willing and wanting. It's it's like recovery, you know. It's uh, you have to desire to do it. You can't do it for anybody else other than you want to do it. You have that desire to heal. And uh, so, so I've had uh, a, a lot of people that have taken the journey. Uh, in my office and, and in their own lives, and, and I'm also on the journey, and uh, as as we all are, and um, and I'm just grateful for the space today uh, to be able to talk about it. I hope we can continue to have a safe space. I, I like that uh, that space, that safe space area. That was a, it was a different um, term, but I think it's really good that we build a sisterhood here and. Uh, and, and I look forward to, to doing that, creating that with each and every one of you. And I was so reminded at uh, lunchtime of uh, Faith, you mentioned um, the cues when, when people are, uh, you know, you read the people in the audience. And I'm so guilty uh, with a, with a co-supervisor uh, of the eye-rolling one. Like, we would Kate, sit on one side, I'd sit on the other, while we would... Mm -hmm. And we, I'm so, I was reminded one of my coworkers. Yeah, it reminded me with you and so and so used to do it. It's like yes, I, I have to be more mindful of that. But thank you for your time. <laughs> Sorry, just to, just as a, to bring it closer to home, there were some men that walked in during lunch, and we were all sitting at the, at the table. And I, at the, the, the ladies that. At the corner, we were all talking about the men walking in and what could they be looking for. And I said, Oh, somebody gave him a flyer. And then I looked over at the one's body language and he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh, I think he's doing it. This is so twig. Who's next? Hey, um, I don't need the microphone. Um, <laughs> at first, I want to say thank you, uh, ladies, for uh, sharing. Did you hear her back then? Kind of. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you um, for sharing your stories and um, you know showing that side of yourself. Um, my name is Crystal Salas Patton, and um, I've worked at the Native American Health Center for almost 15 years now. Um, I am the parent of all adult kids. They're still my kids, even though they're adults. But um, I grew up in a um, I grew up in a highly toxic environment. 
I grew up um, with a mother that, um, when she had me, she was only 15 years old. And by the time she was 17, she had three of us. And um, my father had um, already become addicted to heroin and alcohol and was incarcerated throughout my entire life. Uh, I've never had a personal issue with addiction. And um, it was a choice that I made at a very young age when um, I had to clean up after um, an addicted parent or an addicted relative that was um, using, being sick, kicking their habit, you know, wiping the sweat off of them and giving them water and trying to keep them hydrated and sometimes even going out on the street to cop for them. And um, I didn't realize that I was in such a toxic environment until I got to be a teenager. And then I started paying attention to other households and the way other families operated. And then I was like, whoa, what's going on here? And so I had to really, really go into myself and make a pact with myself to be an honest person, to be a person that um, pursued my happiness and pursued things that I thought would be positive for me. And I did it the best way that I could with the tools that I had given to me by a mom that was only a teenager when she raised us and an unpresent father. So I did make mistakes. You know, I did get involved in some negative things and with negative people. And I was in a, a domestically violent relationship for 10 years until I decided for myself and for my children that I had to make a choice for their safety as well as mine that we needed to leave. It was probably one of the hardest things that I ever had to do because I mean I I wasn't addicted to anything but I was addicted to this person and that was because throughout my life I never felt really connected to anyone except my grandmother and my grandmother was the one who basically saved all of the children's lives because she was always there for us she always had a hot meal a warm bed a roof over our heads little clothes for us so we always went to grandma's house. And it was rough. I mean, I could see her stress because both of her children were addicted to heroin and alcohol. She lost one um, when she wasn't even 30 years old. She drowned in an accident because she had been drinking and left an orphan daughter, which my grandmother raised and I helped her raise because I was already almost 18 years old. So there was just a lot going on. And I had a different jobs throughout my life. But one thing that made me decide I wanted to work with you was that what I didn't have as a youth, and also the fact that it was a way for me to bond with my own children. So before I started working at the health center, there was a lot of stuff going on with me, and just my own personal stuff. And the most healing thing that I did for me, and it turned out for my mother, was to forgive her for everything that she thought she did wrong. And all she was trying to do was be there for us. You know, there was time that we didn't have food or we didn't have clothes or that we were homeless on the street. But I always saw her try. And then she always, like as an adult, I saw her carry this feeling that she wasn't doing her best. And it bothered me because I seen her doing her best. I seen her struggle. She never ever left us. And she never ever gave up. And I just, I really respected that. But it took me to become a woman and to have my own children to see that in my mother. But the best thing that I did for her and myself was to sit there in front of, in ceremony, was to tell her that I forgive you for everything that you think that you did wrong. And that everything that happened happened for a reason, because I am who I am today because of those lessons. And so when I reflect back on my own life, even though I say it was a hard life, I wouldn't change that life. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it because I know I'm who, I'm who I am. And I know that what I give to the youth that I work with, and I know what I have is a whole heart and a full heart for them, and then also an insight to some of the things that they go through. It's like, I can say, I've been there, but you know what, this is what I did to get out of it. I've seen that, but this is what I did to change it. And that 
because we're a product of a community or a product of a household that has toxic things going on, doesn't mean we have to participate in them. That we have a choice, that Creator gives us our own life, and that we have the choice and the opportunity to choose the things that we want to do. And that it's there for us, and it's how we accept it, it's how we deal with it, and how we move on. So the resiliency factor, I guess, was really there for me. I was able to dust myself off every time I fell down. I still fall down, but I get it back up, I dust myself <coughs> off, and I move on. And I know that a lot of that resiliency comes from my faith in Creator. That I held on to that tighter than anything that I could imagine because that was sometimes the only thing that was real to me. And so the youth that we work with, we try to pass that on, we try to be there for them, and it's an unconditional thing. There's no conditions when they come to Tawny or myself or to the other staff that are a part of the youth services program. We really give it our all. And I have to say that, you know, I've been doing this work a long time, and there is an amazing staff that is working with the youth at the health center. The, the youth services program, the, the youth that come through on a regular basis who invest their own time and their efforts and, and um, participate in a lot of the stuff that go on, we see a lot of success because they have a lot of attention, they have a lot of relationships with caring adults, and we also refer them to other areas and other resources. And we see the cycle changing. We see the youth being able to say, I'm not going to participate in a negative lifestyle. I'm going to make a commitment to being a good person for the next generation. And I, it's amazing seeing these young people come out of the program. And I guess that's my, uh, that's my payback, is to see these young people really striving and to uh, do good things. But, you know, we all come from some harsh backgrounds. It's how we get up and just ourselves off.
was something that I found I always did is I always wanted to do it all on my own and never need anybody. I don't want to want anybody. I don't want to need, you know, that's like, um, I don't want to have to rely on people. And I realized I did that same thing to my higher power. I didn't want to rely on it because uh, I felt it hadn't been there for me. I felt it betrayed me. I felt that, you know, I wasn't protected and taken care of. You know, so that I didn't, um, I didn't have that to, you know, it wasn't there. But in fact, in hindsight, what I found out, I turned my back on my spirituality, my, you know, my high power. It was a conscious choice because I was mad, because I was hurt. And then going into this rage and um, just lashing out, whatever you don't deal with will deal with you, whatever you do. Resist, persists. It never goes away until it's until it's surfaced. And uh, that's what I that's what my experience has been. Is to walk through it. I say if it, if it didn't kill you when you were out there, it's not going to relive it in order to heal it. And, um, so there was a lot of things that really resonated with this with this presentation. And uh, really honored to be able to be here and be a part of it and to bring the women that I brought. You know that we were all able to come over here and have this gift to you know, share together and give each other hope and inspire each other and help each other and say, yeah, it's worth it. Come on, you can do it too. You know, it's good for me. I got my own show you. You know, how it works for me. So share it. It's great. Thanks.
and we're willing to, you know, own up to it, but what do we do? Lift our head up and just keep on moving forward. So that's one thing that was always really great about growing up is that my mom was really open with me. Even though times got difficult as a young person, you know, you're going to go away from not wanting to be around your parents and you think you know everything and can do everything for yourself, but the fact that she was, you know, never turned her back away from me and just kind of always was there and willing to talk about whatever it may be. Maybe sometimes I wasn't ready, but she was willing and patient for whenever I was ready to do that. And that's what I've been trying to do with the same thing, the work that I do now. I'm not a parent yet, but um, I've definitely gotten a lot of experience with, with the young people that um, come through our doors. And again, just offering that unconditional love and patience, an uh, ear and an arm for whenever they, they need a hug. Whatever it is, you know, that's what we do. And, I hope that's something that each of you can offer. Like I said, again, if you're not a mother, there's still other young women in your family that you can offer that to. And again, you know, we're not perfect. Don't try to be perfect because none of us are, but still just admit, you know, that we have right, the strength and um, this power. So, yeah. all of you guys.